Hello, everyone. I'm Stephanie Rouser, the founder of Dwell in Peace LLC and a physical therapist assistant in ATP that works at Upstate Cerebral Palsy in Utica, New York. The title of the presentation is Modifying the Home to Promote Independence and Healthy Lifestyles for Children on the Autism Spectrum. When I did the presentation the first time, it was at a training um, at the Wild Center at Tupper Lake. So there were some learning objectives for the people who attended the presentation. Um, they are listed as three modifications that could be made to the home to address auditory, visual, and proprioceptive sensitivities. There's three ways the home can be modified to improve safety and five AT devices that can be used to enhance communication. Well, this says cognition, but I changed that to organization, sensory input, and I changed the recreation to transition because I felt those were more pertinent to a lot of people. So some of the things we're going to talk about today are space to eat, sleep, work, and play, color, flooring, furnishing, and lighting, visual, auditory, sensory input, safety, attitude, and AT devices that support day-to-day -day living. So some considerations for modifications. First thing you need to think about is where are the primary areas for children in the home? Think about where the most amount of time is spent. Generally, that's the bedroom, the bathroom, leisure areas, kitchen, and yards. Although we're not really going to talk about the outside of the home. So um, back to considerations for modifications. We want to consider the behaviors to be modified and the relationship they have with the environment. Remember, behaviors serve a purpose, and you should really try to understand the behaviors before trying to alter it. For example, if a child puts things in the toilet, then maybe you want to look at the safety elements first. Okay, so a very important part that I added right in the beginning is a cool down room. Lots of people on the spectrum have a very difficult time with being overwhelmed with sensory overload, and they need a safe place to go that will help them calm before they have a meltdown. Um, only poor, okay, so um, one of the things that it's important for people to understand is it should never be in the bedroom. Bedrooms should be associated with sleeping and not other activities because sleeping is a difficult thing for some people. If there is not an alternate room where there can be a cool down area, then it could just be a tent, a teepee, some blankets and pillows in the corner with soft music and soft toys, and just a place where, where it's quiet and peaceful. Also, something I consider very important is some advice for parents and get caregivers. If there's a high level of stress in your home, if the tone of your home is happy and warm and safe and secure, then that's not really a problem. What if if it's like an everyday thing that everything is stressful and nothing happens on time and you're getting upset about it, that really reflects on your face and in your posture and in your voice. And that can cause tension and stress. So what people really need to consider is to never neglect yourself and your own feelings because that sets the tone for the atmosphere of the household. So some suggestions for decreasing stress. This is like across the board for all of us, not just people who live with children on the spectrum, but just some ideas to prioritize your feelings first. Most caregivers 
family members, especially mothers, do not put their feelings first. But if you don't put yourself first, then it's difficult to help others. Find a little quiet time for yourself. Maybe go outside and get some fresh air and some sunshine to help you relax. A very important thing is to minimize contact with people who cause you stress and insecurity. I've been working at the CP Center for 37 years, and it's very difficult for some of our parents to be around people that always question how they raise their child, how they react to things their child do, and that's difficult for them, and then they get more stress. I'm also big on clearing clutter, not loving clutter anywhere, and um, having a house filled with clutter makes people anxious. So keeping things organized, that's always good, and looking to join a support group. Um, We at the UCP Center have an offshoot called the Kelberman Center, and that's all things autism. They have parent support groups, they have play groups, they have coffee groups, they have mentors for new parents. So if you are attached to a local agency, you might want to check to see if there's any kind of support groups that can be helpful to you. Some associated behaviors um, are behaviors associated with a stressful environment. And when I presented this um, at the Calverman Center, I have a very close friend who's autistic. And when she saw this slide, she said, so are these behaviors for the person on the spectrum or are they the behaviors of the caregivers and parents? And when you look at them, I think maybe some of them are for both. But the intent was for the people on the spectrum and what happens to them when they're in a stressful environment. Their behaviors might be more challenging. They may have more intense and frequent self-stimming. I have a number of guys who put their shirts over their heads. If the classrooms are very loud or music is loud, they will just sink their head right inside their shirts. Um, You might not have too many good facial expressions, not a lot of smiling, not a lot of social interactions. People might elope from the room and run out. Uh, Very little eye contact or motivation to interact with what's going on. So how do behaviors affect the home environment? Behaviors are attempts to introduce order into chaotic worlds. And as important as order and routines are, sometimes they interfere. So I know a couple of young people that are on the spectrum, and they're very intent on where everyone sits at the table. There's four chairs, there's four people, that's it. Now, if grandma comes for dinner or your aunt or cousin comes, where are they going to sit? Because now that changes the whole dynamic. So sometimes changing everyday occurrences make adapting to change a little bit easier. It's not as easy as that sounds, I get that, but sometimes to make sure that not everything is so routine and stringent that you can never break from the pattern because that causes a lot of anxiety. Um, Discouraging unacceptable routines quickly will make it easier to add new ones. So you have to be very careful. Um, I live on a routine so I don't have to think too much about what I do when I get up in the morning. Some of my friends on the spectrum are the same way. They've learned to adapt better because they did find as they age, these are adult people now, that they could not keep living like that because life throws curveballs every day. So their ability to deal with that kind of thing has improved a lot since they changed that attitude. Um, Saying no promotes strong reaction and causes behaviors that may be withdrawal, less motivation, and less engagement. Some ways to, you know, curb saying no all the time. Maybe you want to 
you know, do a let's make a deal thing. You know, when you finish this, then you'll be able to watch TV or listen to your music. Um, different ways to do that so no does not come out of your mouth for every sentence. So some behaviors that I have seen personally in all my years at UCP and with some of my friends um, that affect home safety, throwing utensils, breaking plates and cups, sweeping items off surfaces, dumping drawers, breaking windows, climbing out of windows, flushing items down the toilet, turning the water on in the bathtub and walking away, inserting things into electrical sockets, chewing on wires, playing on matches. These behaviors are not just for people on the spectrum. Some typical children do the same thing. Um, and there are ways to alleviate some of this. And we'll talk about some of those as we come along. So sensory overload, sensitivity to sight, sounds, touch, causes unwanted behavior. But on the opposite end of that, some children need sensory stim to help them function. So the goal shouldn't be to get rid of the sensory stim behavior, but to channel it into more appropriate and productive activities. Chronic noise is a problem for many, many people on the spectrum. It's actually a problem for me, and I assume it's a problem for a number of you out there. Chronic noise stresses our endocrine, cardiovascular, and immune system. It disturbs sleep and emotional well-being. A lot of people on the spectrum have heightened hearing and sounds that might not even be notable, noticeable to us, but cause terrible reactions in them. They cry, they whine, they cover their ears, they have temper tantrums. So what are some of those sounds? Refrigerators and air conditioning humming, furnaces turning on and blowing. I can attest to that. We have a new furnace, and when the furnace comes on, it's very loud in every room. Washing machines spinning and clunking, dishwashers, food processors televisions, radios, people talking on their cell phones where, you know, other people don't want to hear their conversation, traffic, wind, someone's voice. Some people just can't tolerate different voices. How many of you are disturbed by some of those sounds? I bet there's a few hands that could raise for that. Um, Let's see, so how do we diminish sounds in our houses? Maybe we put carpet on the floors, we make sure our windows have drapes or blinds, that there are some wall hangings on the walls, that the bookcases aren't totally empty of books. Maybe if you put some cork or rubber mats or some, something under some of your appliances that you keep on the countertop that might vibrate. If you have storm doors and solid doors, double-paned windows do a wonder. I live on Main Street, and it's very difficult to keep the windows open in the summer because I hear all the traffic. So generally, I just keep the uh, windows closed and put the air on. You might want to seal your doors and windows with weather stripping. And if you plant trees and bushes around the perimeter of the house, that kind of keeps sound at bay. If you're a big HGTV fan, everybody wants open floor plans in their house. However, sound does bounce around pretty freely in that kind of a home, and there's not a lot of stuff to absorb the sound. Um, maybe it's best to consider a house with more specific rooms to help keep that under control. The picture here doesn't look like there's much on the walls or on the windows. I do see an area rug there and some pillows, but overall, I bet sound does just move around that. Might be a difficult thing for someone on the spectrum.
Now, sound stimulation, if you've ever heard people humming, repeating everything you say, babbling, screaming, I have people that will bite their hands to scream and have something in the atmosphere. Now, those people, if you have a little background music, little instrumental or classical music, a lot of people keep fans on summer, winter, it doesn't matter, just for that white noise. They do have some white noise machines that people buy also to help them. But the important fact about it, that is that it can't be loud or intrusive. It's just supposed to be a little bit in the background. So the silence isn't deafening because that happens with some people also. Now, visual overstimulation, that's kind of, you know, a lot. There's a lot of that in a lot of places. There's a lot of atmospheres that we're in and environments that have bright lights, a lot of movement, TVs that are on constantly with rapidly changing scenes, clutter, busy walls, patterned floors. That's a difficult atmosphere for some people. And as a result, they might look at spinning objects like the um, fidget things that people use now. Um, they might turn their face away from someone talking. And it might not be the sound as much as it is maybe too much jewelry or maybe too much makeup even. Um, lots of people that are overstimulated visually, they can't find things on crowded shelves. They lose their place when reading. However, they usually know where all of their things are. My friend Laura, she's on the spectrum, and she's an adult, and everything has a place, like her movies and DVDs. If you touch one of them, you must make sure that you leave the appropriate space to slide that right back in, because that will drive her crazy for the rest of the day. So how do we decrease visual overstimulation? Maybe the walls in each room should be a little bit more muted colors and not very bright colors. The floor should be plain, tiled or wooden. Light dimmers are fabulous. They really help with some of that. Um, some people wear sunglasses inside. And clutter, again, could be just too much visual overstimulation. It is for me. I had a client who was kind of a hoarder, and it was very difficult for me to concentrate on what was going on because my eyes were drawn all over the place. So to increase visual stimulation, uh, those of you that work in schools or if you have a child on the spectrum, there's lots of fiber optic things and the color tubes with lights, the little fidget things, those are always a, a good thing to help with stimulation. Um, lots of people get stuck on TVs and moving patterns that they really like and they find that comforting. And if that's the case, sometimes you use the videos and TVs to help you get a point across because that's where they're drawn. So sense of smell. Smell can cause behaviors, gagging, nausea, headache, vomiting. I'm not on the spectrum, but I also do have some issues with overpowering smells. Um, they've done some studies. I read a number of them. They really didn't come up with any conclusions. Some people believe that the issues with smell are tied to social deficits. Other studies believe that typical children change the way they smell good and bad odors. Well, children on the spectrum smell everything the same way. For instance, that this young woman in the picture is smelling the flower. Children on the spectrum may hold that flower right up their nose to smell it, and they might take a dirty diaper and do the same thing without holding it back like a typical person would you know, hold it far away from their hand. Um, so if you think about what your face looks like when you smell something bad, 
as opposed to something good. I guess you'd have to, you know, check in the mirror when you're doing that to see if you really, really do change the way you look when you smell. Um, or if you work with people on the spectrum, it might be an interesting thing to do to just watch people smell different smells, good and bad. So oversensitivity to smells can cause toileting problems. Children might dislike people that wear a lot of perfume that's not pleasing to them. Strong smells may be cause to, um, people to explore or do self-stim. And they might be neat freaks and shower often to get rid of smells. If they're somewhere where they can't, don't like the smell, they just might want to shower. So if they're undersensitive to smell, some children with limited ability to smell may lick items to identify them. And they might like really strong, what we would term as gross smells because they don't get enough input from their senses, from their sense of smell. So some things to consider with smell. Scents, the best scents should come from fresh plants, flowers, favorite foods, open windows. I just read an article today about the cold and how people stay in the house and keep the windows closed all the time and they don't want to go out in the cold. But they recommend opening the windows inside the house for at least two to three minutes every day despite the temperature just to get fresh air in the house. If your child or person likes a favorite scent, maybe use that for body wash and soap. A lot of people use 100% grade essential oils to promote self-regulation. Um, some of the oils that they choose are cedar, um, cedar wood, lavender, sandalwood. Those are all supposed to help with relaxation and mental clarity. Um, lavender is really a big, uh, a big thing for lots of people. Um, I use lavender myself for sleep. Uh, oh, frankincense, they also mention for focus, to help people focus. Which I've never tried that, but I might try that myself. Try to stay away from chemical-based smells and candles, air fresheners, and sprays. Um, those are overpowering, particularly if you're a person that likes candles and has a different scent in every room. I myself have a problem when I go to my sister's because she's one of those people. I can't breathe. Um, maybe use some nose plugs if it's necessary and keep car vents open in the, in the car. If, you know, hopefully no one's smoking in the car with their children at this point in life, but, you know, something to consider. Use diffusers if you're cooking onions and no one can stand that smell or fish. And avoid dryer sheets because they have a lot of hazardous chemicals. If you live in a small community and you walk, and if you really pay attention, more prominently, I think, in the cold than in the warmth, you can actually smell those dryer sheets, the different smells, and know who's doing laundry in your community. So I had to put this funny picture of my husband and son on here um, to make things a little lightened up. And the kitchen is the heart of the home. It, when you work together in the kitchen, you can enhance all kinds of skills for, for children and adults, typical children and children on the spectrum, like fine motor skills, sequencing, math, manners, social interactions. There's a lot of things for kitchen time. I know this is small. I hope you can all read that. I wanted to try to include as many things as I can think of. To use plastic dishes, rubber cups to promote independence. If you know your child doesn't hold things well and might drop things off and you really don't want a lot of broken dishes and glasses on the floor. Make sure there's enough seating for everyone and have a couple of extra chairs for company so you don't disrupt the routine. Again, I have clutter in there. Labeling cupboards is also a good idea if you want your children to learn how to 
set the table or put the dishes back after they're dried. You put pictures of cups and dishes and, you know, whatever, that, so they can identify where they need to be. Lots of appliances now have safety features. Induction ovens are great because you can place your hands right on them and not get burned. Instead of having your counters cluttered with every small appliance that you own, maybe keep them away and only bring the um, can opener out when you're going to actually open a can. Stop and no signs should always be on cupboards where you have things stored that they can't go. Knives and matches and cleaning supplies. A big red stop sign gives them the idea that not any place I need to be. They have plastic knobs to put on doors and faucets and ranges and everywhere. Um, keep furniture away from the counters if you have children that like to climb, because if you turn your back for a second, they're going to be on top of the cupboard. And again, lock away the knives and all that. Everyone should do that anyways if they have any children. And if you want your children to bring dishes to the sink, maybe have a little wheeled cart or a little wagon or something that they can put them in and carry them, particularly if you're in the dining room and the dishes have to go into the kitchen. Okay, bedrooms. A bedroom is a place where a child should go to sleep at night and wake up in a calm and safe atmosphere. That's where you replenish your senses. It shouldn't be for discomfort and isolation. I never sent my son to his bedroom to, for time out. I think that was more because he had too many things to play with. But sitting him on the stairs worked great because there was nothing there. Um, but a bedroom is for sleeping. Lots of people need to understand that. Children need to understand that. So some considerations for bedrooms. Specific colors, blues, greens, purples, browns, black, those are more soothing colors. There again, white noise machine, out of those little projectors that put images on the wall. Um, even some people I know, the ones that have, are popular now outside at Christmas time, they're smaller ones for inside that have simple things on the walls. Uh, computers, games, wires, they really should never be in the bedroom. Soft sheets, soft colors, solid comforters, maybe a themed pillow that's a little more bright, and limited pictures, landscapes, curves and spirals, straight lines, angles, those kind of very modern things are not very warm and soothing for a bedroom. Some other things to think about, even if you have a lot of patterns, those waves, whether the lights are on and off, they emit vibrations that affect the brain, sometimes good, sometimes not so good. Please try not to confuse sensory integration needs with sensory environmental needs. Sensory environment promotes intellectual activity and encourages relaxation. Sensory integration is the more over and under reactive to stimuli and might be a reason for self-stim behavior. So really, it's more about the environment than it is the integration. When you look at the room, look at closets to put items in or high shelves so everything isn't right visible. Ask yourself, can my child sleep in here? Can he play quietly in here? Can he enjoy his room and learn in his room? Some people believe beds should be away from windows and against a full wall because some children will spend the whole time just looking out the window. And some people believe that you have to be very careful about the kind of curtains that you have or if you use vertical blinds because if the window is open with vertical blinds, it is kind of a loud sound and it may not be a good thing for your child. 
So just to take a picture, a look at this um, bedroom and, you know, like you would do in a bedroom, just ask yourself the question, is the bed spread too busy? Are there too many books on the shelf? Can you access the storage easy? What do you think of the wall color? Are the pictures okay for the walls? The floor pattern, is that too busy? Is there enough light? Is there enough on the windows to prevent sounds from coming in with just shades on there? And what do you think of the bed placement? Those are all you know, answers that you can find yourself. Okay, moving right on to the bathroom. Bathrooms are big for so many reasons. Some kids love bathing, some kids hate bathing. When you have a child that doesn't necessarily love bathing, then the soap, the shampoo, the washcloth, everything you need immediately should be right there. The toys and that kind of thing maybe can be off to the side, so when they're done doing what they have to do, they can play with their toys for a little while. Maybe if you have some open lip bottles that they can unscrew the cap and dump the shampoo or conditioner in their mouth, might be better if you have pump dispensers because they would not be so easy to get out. Uh, cover your faucets to prevent burns. Lots of people don't pay attention to how hot their water, is, water heater is set, and just a minute of hot water will be scalding to a young child. Um, and of course, keep your medications and first aid supplies in locked cabinets. That's for all of us that have young children. So transitioning to toileting, I included this in just to help people understand that sometimes toileting is a very difficult concept for children on the spectrum especially if they have communication challenges and if they wear diapers too long, it's very difficult for them to break that routine. Toilet seats can be very helpful. Lots of little people use the regular toilet that the whole family uses and the hole on that toilet is really large and scary hard to balance and do what you have to do. So maybe purchasing some of these cool, fun little toilet seats that make the area smaller, they're softer, so you can balance a little better and then be a little bit more confident about sitting on the toilet and doing your business. Some other things that are helpful is to use a timer to help your child learn how to go to the bathroom on the toilet. After he drinks, set the clock for 10 to 20 to 30 minutes. Go away and sit down on the toilet. If nothing happens after counting to 20, get off the toilet. Go play for another 10 minutes. Go back and try again. Really making light of accidents is important and not making a big deal out of it. And trying to move the underwear as soon as possible. Um, according to a lot of parents that I work with, is really helpful, has been helpful for them. Okay, so a playroom. A playroom is a place to play and learn. You can have sensory equipment in there. You can have vestibular and proprioceptive input in there. But it's hard for parents sometimes to get away from trying to integrate sensory things like they do in therapy. Um, I, sometimes it's just important to play, to have unstructured play. That's necessary for development, and it, it, it's, it's a good thing to do. Um, so it doesn't have to be therapy every time someone is playing. I know most people might not have a playroom that looks like this, and some people might think it's too busy. But everything that you see here is pertinent to some, but not all people. So some people have swings in the playroom, just some considerations for swings. That small swing on the top is a relatively inexpensive thing that you can get from um, like Amazon. 
They're a great way to organize and regulate the sensory system to help children calm. Safety should always be considered with mats underneath in case they fall out so they're not close to a wall in case they bump it. Young children should never be on a swing unless they're supervised. This kind of swing isn't so bad, but the kind that swing in circles, not safe to be alone. Some people forget, too, to check the maximum weight capacity because they might buy a swing for a child that's five or six who's still using it at 12 or 13, and maybe they're 75 pounds heavier, and that's not the capacity for the swing, and that could be a safety issue. Um, a child should always be able to stop the movement on their own, and they should never be coerced into engaging in an activity on a swing if they're really resistant to it. Other things to think about in a playroom. Having a small, intimate space is better than having a, you know, 14 by 16 room filled to the brim with toys. Depending on your child, you might want to minimize some of the visual distractions and cover the windows. If your kid doesn't sit down and play with blocks, he just stands and looks out the window at the cars going by. A nice padded floor is good because children like to lay down on, on the floor and play with um, toys, cars, those kind of things. But also having a table and chair for tabletop activities is a good thing because you still want to promote good posture. And if you have a child that doesn't like to stay put um, and they run out of the room every two minutes, I'm going to go to the bathroom, I've got to get a drink of water, I've got to get my snack, maybe those things should be brought into the room so they have some uninterrupted time to play. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to um, type those in and we will address them as we go along. So here's a couple of things that we use in therapy, but also are good for a playroom. This blue chair is found at Amazon, and it's relatively inexpensive, and it's very comfortable to sit and read, you know, together or alone. This little canoe is great for some proprioceptive input, too, because young children like to sit in there, and it kind of hugs you tightly, so that's really helpful. And, of course, a small trampoline that you can keep inside is great for proprioception. Not therapy, but, you know, a little sensory input that might be helpful for a very active child. Lighting. When you have lighting, you really should consider the intensity, whether or not lighting can be dim, and the color rendering when choosing the lighting. Because if you took five different light bulbs, and there's a million different kinds now, everything in the room would change its color slightly with the shades of the light bulbs. If the lights are very bright, you might want to filter them. And some of our classrooms, they bought some sheets. I don't know, they were maybe 20 by 24. With Velcro, they can go right over the ceiling lights to make it a little bit less bright in there. There's a lot of light bulbs on the market that are called Soul White Daylight Reveal or Spectrum Bulbs. Those are good um, lighting options and LED lights too. Sometimes individual lights for different areas of the house are a good thing. Um, do be careful with light bulbs. So if you if you want your child to do their homework in a specific place, because when light bulbs, there was that whole thing about switching light bulbs out and everything. Um, we did that. I could not read well with those light bulbs in my living room. I had to go out and buy ones that specifically stated that because it was very difficult. And if you have a child that that can read but maybe it doesn't vocalize and say my eyes are hurting because I'm trying to see. It just might be something to consider. Small night lights are a great thing. There's tons of cool ones out on the market now. Natural sunlight is the best option for light, but you do have to be careful of glare. Other thoughts on lighting? Sensors could be disoriented when they go on and off. Um, 
motion lights that react to body movements are good if you really can't have a difficult time flipping switches on. And, and in this day and age, there's so much more of that on the market. Glare, contrast, and intensity cause distortion. Lines and curtains are good. They, they might, you know, protect from the natural sunlight glare and maybe add a little more visual interest. Fluorescent bulbs are not good for any of us. They contain mercury, they distort color, they do buzz and strobe at high frequencies when they're starting to lose power. And not just people on the spectrum, but a lot of people have problems. Headaches, migraines, some people claim their seizures are caused from fluorescent lights. And I found these, um, uh, there was a number of people in my research that use these KD brand tinted glasses indoors. And these are small adult sunglasses. They're lightweight. I think they're from biking, but they fit under a helmet in case your child needs a helmet. They have some reinforced temples. They're very lightweight, so if they have to wear them in the house, it's, it's generally not a problem. Flooring. Consider practicality and sound absorption when choosing the floor. Most people believe that natural wood is your best option, but not everybody can afford natural wood in their house. Laminate floors look like wood. They're not wood. I have laminate floors. They were the thing to do, you know, a number of years back. Hate them. They, they really do make noise. They're not at all like real wood. The vinyl planks are really good, though. They're soft. They're warmer to the touch. They're easy to maintain. Carpet tiles, too, work really good because they can just be pulled right up and replaced with a, you know, another one if, if they've been damaged. Porcelain tiles are very cold. They're very hard. If you drop anything on them, they break. If you hit your head on them, it hurts. And there's absolutely no sound absorption with porcelain tiles. Lots of people like these patterned checkboard effects, like in the bottom picture here, but they are not good. Some children that have, I don't know if it has to do with vision or, I really couldn't pinpoint that, but they really look at like some of those dark holes and dark places and think they could fall through them. I have a man, well, I had a man, he moved now, but he didn't do lines or any of that sort of stuff, and no one really realized it in our building. There's a lot of people that come in there when they put the new floors in. He had a terrible time even trying to get from one end of the hall to the other. Furniture. Thoughts on furniture. What is best if the natural grain shows through? A lot of ideas on high gloss, reds and yellows and oranges undertones weren't very good. If the furniture is painted, it should be that really dark brown espresso or charcoal or black. Rounded corners are much safer for anyone with children, not just children on the spectrum. Simple furniture. Chairs with arms and that wrap around are really good for doing work, homework, sitting at a table, so that kind of encompassing them, it's not so easy to get out of. Try to arrange the furniture in a way that makes sense for what happens in your home every day. If eloping and running from a room is a predictable thing that's going to happen, you might not want to have everything a line so that there's a straight run right out through the you know living room into the kitchen and out the door. So you might want to move some of your furniture around to prevent that. Again, you might want to think about climbing and where your shelves are and where your furniture is, especially if your shelves are hooked very good to the wall. Um, and that does remind me, I did forget to add in the bedroom thing, People that have furniture, dressers that sit up high, um, TV stands, those sort of things, they do sell them now with things to keep them attached to the wall. 
because pulling out dresser drawers and stuff could cause them to tip and fall on the child. And if you have a sweeper, you do not want to have all your beautiful crystal on a table or, you know, a lot of books or papers that you need because one wish of their arm, everything is going to be on the floor. Color. People on the spectrum detect color at very high intensity. They say, I, I say they because there's a lot of people who consider themselves experts on this sort of thing. Um, opt for subdued and muted tones, not really pure, vivid colors everywhere around. Um, colors and tonal blocks, different shades of blues or greens. Lighting and shade helps build relationships between spatial things. Um, that's a hard concept for people, but it has to do with shadows and, you know, if the light's coming through a window and you have a chair, a small chair there, but the way it hits the shadow makes the chair look like it's six feet long, that's the kind of thing. Um, also look at colors in daylight and in artificial light. Warm light at night is different than bright light during the day. A light green could look more blue in different colors or even white at, at different times of the day. Um, if the child really likes primary colors, you might not want to put them on the walls because they might pay more attention to the walls than they do interacting with people. If you really want them to pay attention to you for some reason and they love red, then maybe you should wear a red shirt that day. Um, and if luminous colors are preferred, very bright things, a couple of small objects works. You know, a picture frame or a chair or something in that neon green, that, that's fine, but a whole bedroom in neon green might just be a little bit of overkill. Safety. Safety is a concern for everyone. Typical children, children on the spectrum, there's lots of behaviors, lots of issues with safety. There's a ton of stuff on the market uh, in the, this day and age. The gates with locks. I mean, years ago, they had the little wooden gates, and that's all you got. Now there's probably 25 different kinds that you can use depending on your child's fine motor ability. They have cabinet locks for kitchens and bathrooms. They have, um, oh, sorry, I moved to mirrors already, but they have locks for windows and doors and, you know, everything that you could think of. Other safety things, glass, mirrors. There are some kids that pound a lot on those kind of things. You might not want to have a real mirror. You might want to make that acrylic. Maybe nothing metal and sharp. This um, little shelf, this little table in the picture, that's probably right at forehead level for some children, so that might not be a good place for that table with a glass thing on top of it that could fall and shed. I have had a couple of people that had to replace their large windows in the front of their homes because their children were always banging on them and they were scared to death that they were going to break them couple of them even in the car, but car windows are much harder to break. And I don't know if I think you could replace car windows with plexiglass, but you can do that at home. Some people even have to put bars on their windows to prevent that from happening. Electricity, a lot of children on the spectrum, they want to know how things work. So covering outlets, not having tons of wires all over the place. I found these very cool, I don't know, they're maybe a foot long, maybe a little bit longer. They're like these long black neoprene thin pieces that have Velcro on them. So you can bundle all your TV wires together and then Velcro it up. And then maybe if you got DVD players or surround sounds or everything, you can bundle all those up. So all of the wires aren't there, just that black pieces there. Um, if you have appliances, you might want to hide some of them or not keep them all plugged in on the counter. Other safety considerations. 
like I said again, typical children also. Blinds and shades that do not have cords. I don't understand for the life of me why many blinds have cords that are, I don't know, eight feet long. Mine are all tied up on the top, even though I don't have young children. Um, door alarms and window alarms. We found some alarms in the dollar store. They worked great. Loud enough, if that door opens, you know it's happening. A lot of people with um, family members that have dementia, those are really helpful for that too. If you have a child that's a wanderer that elopes off, and you probably should let the police and fire department know. Give them an idea of who your child is and let them, you know, be on the lookup. Plastic knobs on appliances, we had already talked about that for a kitchen. I'm pretty sure most people should know that if your fireplace is on and your grill is running, you should not leave your small child alone with them. There are stickers to put on your child's bedroom window to alert firemen that this is where the children are. Um, and really one of the best things is to be a good role model for good behavior. If you have other children, help them understand that they can help teach good things and good behavior for safety. There's a lot of alert bracelets, necklaces, label clothing, fanny packs, book bags, lots of things that you can do alerts about seizures and autism, asthma, everything you can think of. Some people use tracking devices or perimeter systems. I, I, I'm, I can't quite figure out the perimeter system. We had a wireless one for the dog, but of course she had a collar on. I really can't understand how that would work with a child because you really wouldn't want to zap them if they went out. I'm, I, I really don't know, but that was something that I found. Um, service dogs are really a good thing to help prevent elopement. Uh, again, reinforce safe and appropriate behavior. You can never do that enough. And be consistent with consequences for unsafe and inappropriate behavior. If you let that slide two times it's a habit, it makes it a lot more difficult. Social stories, pictures, way to communicate, safety issues in the home and in the community should be an ongoing thing from the time your children move from 2 to 22 if they're on the spectrum and they don't have any expressive communication. Okay, we're coming to the end. AT devices. They can assist with sensory stim, with motor skills, communication, academics, organization, independence, social interaction, transitioning. There's four kinds of AT devices. A lot of people aren't aware that a no-tool AT device means you use strategies and in environmental arrangements in actions. There's not an actual object. It's just ways to deal with things. Low-tech devices, they're not electronic or battery-operated. They're low-cost, they're easy to use. Those are your dry erase boards, your binders, your photo albums, picture cards, highlighting tape. Those are all low-tech. Mid-tech things people are more involved with, uh, especially in schools, electronic, battery-operated, voice output, tape recorders, timers, calculators, projectors, and your high-tech things are more video cameras, software, computer hardware, complex voice outputs like Dynaboxes, and all those things. So for sensory needs, there really aren't any high-tech devices for sensory needs, but your no-tech things, just limiting colors, hanging peaceful objects on the wall, Auditorily, you're watching the pitch and the volume and the rate of voices, multi-sensory ways to ensure personal space, vestibular, just to get up and stretch and move. Lots of people in classrooms, there's a lot of that, sit down, sit down, sit down. People need to get up and move. 
especially children. We all need to get up and move at least once every hour. Children specifically need to get up to do that. So some low-tech things for oral. People use gum, they use water, they use chew toys. Proprioception, all of you who are therapists are well aware of using rolled mats and pillows and weighted vests and all those sort of things. For vestibular, you can have specific seat cushions, balls, swings, a variety of different chairs, multi-sensory things to communicate, cards to communicate when they need a break because sometimes we don't pick up on the clues. So if they have a card that says, I need a break, they hold it up, then you say, oh, yeah, probably you do. Um, neutral colors, again, for visual and tactile, lots of push balls and the fidget things, and sometimes just a soft object to hold and squeeze to help them feel better if they're starting to get agitated. Mid-tech things are choice boards with visual output, computer games, software programs. A lot of the mid-tech and high-tech things are the same objects just used in a different way for different things. Um, okay, communication, receptive and expressive. I, I kind of changed this around. Um, you're not going to see the changes, but some of it was just a little too much. Most people are the most familiar with AT devices for communication. Low-tech things for expressive communication, schedules, objects, pictures magnetic folders, calendars at home and at school, that universal no symbol to communicate when you need to stop doing what you're doing or it's not going to happen right now. Directions, visual directions on the board to help teach sequencing and steps on how to get from point A to point F in doing an activity. And an activity termination card to say, all done. This task is all done. No tech items. You know, just a pause for um, receptive language, just a pause to allow processing time. A lot of our people don't get if you say, go to the window, open it up, stick your hand out, bring it back in. Too many steps. It's all working through their mind. So maybe just one step at a time. Go to the window. Give them a few minutes to get there. Once they're there, open the window. Let that process, that's the kind of thing. Again, the low-tech things are pretty much the same. A picture communication board, pack card, break cards, choice cards, finish cards. Past events, we have a number of people who communicate in their own way. They, they're verbal, but the, the words are not as clear as mine. So when they come into Dayhab, they want to explain or kind of tell us what happened last night. The ambulance came to the house and took the peer away. We can't get what they're saying, and it causes a lot of frustration and agitation. But now we have people at the house right in the communication book. Last night, Joe went to the hospital. Jeff was upset. This is what happened, blah, blah, blah. So now we can have a conversation with him. We get through all that. We're good to go. We have also found that using, uh, um, before I move on to that one, real pictures instead of pet cards has really helped us tremendously. We've made lots of activities about having a camera. Instead of a pet card for the church with a, you know, with a stick picture with a cross on it, to take an actual picture of the church that they go to, I think helps them understand better where they're going. An actual picture of McDonald's instead of a picture on a pet card of a sandwich that I assume is a hamburger. Um, but we have really had a lot of activity to take the pictures, to print the pictures, to cut the pictures out, to put them in a binder or folder or a thing on the wall, something to help them communicate. Your mid-tech things, again, people out there are familiar with multiple speech generating devices or single speech generating devices, the little red switch, 
word processors, interactive stories, which lots of card shops sell now that, you know, if you have a grandchild that lives far away, even that you can talk, do the story with your, in your own voice so they can hear that. Computers, calculators, and the high-tech devices, videotaping, again, the software, and telekeys, big keys, e-books. E-books are huge now. You can get them anywhere free on a lot of different sites. Touch screens are really helpful. Digital cameras and track balls if fine motor skills aren't that good. So here we have the interactive storybook. Here we have um, a track ball and the large keyboard that helps people type. And a lot of schools are using smart boards now. I don't understand too much about a smart board, but I know that they're in a lot of the classrooms. Behaviors. How does AT devices help behaviors? Our best way to do that is through low tech things. We have rules and expectations of good behavior displayed. We list good choices and alternate behaviors. We use pictures and words to help self regulate if, if things are getting a little bit too much. Reward cards and finish cards. This picture with one of the guys, um, they, they participated in coming up with all of the signs and the things that they need for their own personal life, and they made this little thing. Mid tech devices, same idea, timers, video recorders, computers, videos, those are all pretty much the same, just used in different ways for different things. Organization I included in this because I do evals for what was vested that's now called Access DR. With a lot of high school seniors and people that are going to college, and they're at college level and still do not even understand how to organize anything. So to start at a very young age with no tech and low tech things is a really good idea. Because if you wait until you're a senior in high school and you want to go to college, it's a little late to learn how to organize. It doesn't make college life or high school senior life any easier. So having a defined workspace, color coding, highlighting, calendars and schedules, there's a ton of them online where you can print pictures and pages and you can use, um, I use, what do I want to call it? Um, OneNote through Microsoft Word, and you can sync them to phones and tablets and computers and all that. To do lists are very important for us all. Um, to organize with paper notebooks. I know a lot of people are into everything electronic, but sometimes just a simple paper notebook is more helpful and easier. Mid-tech items, again, simple speech devices, timers, digital recorders, you know, mid and high-tech, software, cell phones, lots of things you can do on cell phones and with tablets and everything that have accessibility things all in right in there now that make it easier to do things. Social interactions are really huge for people on the spectrum. A lot of social scripts, social stories, if anybody's not familiar, they're all over the place. Social stories and social scripts can get you to do everything from taking your shoes and socks off to going to the dentist to washing dishes. Um, weight cards. Weight cards are important for very impulsive people. Help cards. To know when to ask for help and to know when to take turns. It's not your turn, so you can't move your person until the other people do it. And one message device is just those simple switches. Again, one message devices, speech generated devices, audios, those are all the same for, like I say, a variety of different things. 
And the last one I have is transitioning. Transitioning is very difficult for children on the spectrum, going from one place or one activity to another without understanding what's happening can cause some serious behaviors. But if you're prepared, it can, you know, make it a little bit easier without a lot of stress and without having to use coping skills. So for no tech things, practice what it means to move from recess to reading group or vice versa or, you know, now you're going to walk down the hall and go to gym class in a quiet time to practice what needs to happen. And then signals to terminate activities and cues to start a new thing with cards or whatever works. To write schedules, to communicate when a change is going to happen. This next page has that. So there's an I need a break card. The one with Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we made for one of our guys who had a difficult time. My picture's on there down in the corner on the OT's picture. It said walk. They go to a place to do music with seniors. That picture's on there. So Kevin always knows Monday this is what I do. And, you know, okay, Steph's picture's there. That means I'm going to PT today. So that's a helpful thing. This other schedule with the 839, 915 thing, that's for a woman who's in, actually, I think she just turned 30. Um, she's not really on the spectrum, but she has some tendencies. She has a lot of behaviors, and too much downtime is not her threat. So the classroom staff put this together to help her understand that this is what time it is, and this is what we're supposed to be doing at that time. It really has limited her behaviors because now she knows what to expect. Um, but it is really important to understand that some people cannot know too early on if they have an appointment. If we told one of our guys, Jeff, on Monday that Wednesday he had an appointment all day every day from Monday to Wednesday, that's all he would talk about. So there are the people that you can't always give a heads up on what's going to happen because that's what they'll obsess about. And again, timers, watches, videotapes. Okay, just a quick question I see. Ideas for age-appropriate fidgets for high school. When those fidgets came out years ago for people on the spectrum, I thought they were fabulous. Um, now, now I see in Walmart they're giving them away for 25 cents because there's like a thousand boxes that typical kids really didn't need them. Some ideas for fidgets for high school. I've seen things maybe to sit on. I've seen things that can go underneath feet. Um, my friend Laura, who is on the spectrum, she has these little, I think she called them worry stones, and she gave me one. They're very smooth, but they're kind of rounded out in the middle, and that's what she uses. She also uses little things that you probably can buy in the dollar store. They're little shapes, little animals, little you know, people, little flowers, those kind of things, because she says that the edges, she likes to run across her fingers because those help. Maybe a little, little small disc to sit on might be something for a fidgeter. And I know lots of school districts in specific classrooms have kids sit on therapy balls. So, um, Julie, I hope that was helpful at all, sometimes without looking for therapeutic things, but just combing the shelves in places like the dollar stores and even thrift stores and those kind of things. It, it's amazing what you can pick up and all of a sudden and think, wow, that, that might really work. Um, okay, I guess that was the end.
I hope I've given you some food for thought. Um, what I did want to state about references, I've been a therapist for 40 years. I'm in my 37th year at UCP. I collect information from the time I started in, in the 70s to be a therapist. All interesting things, things I think that would be helpful, I've collected over the years. When I decided to do this, of course, I did more research, but because of my business, I just collect information. So what you see here is just a dedication of all my time and research, numerous articles, lots of trainings, experts, and a lot of my friends that are on the spectrum have taught me about all of these things. Might not be pertinent to everyone, but some of it should be helpful to different people. And these are the places that you might want to look for other information that I found things from. Pathfinders for Autism, Autism Parody Magazine, which is a fabulous magazine. Any autism programming, so I found a friendship circle, a lot of autism, love to know, autism society, autism speaks, um, inclusion.com, wati.org. I think that's from Wisconsin. They are just amazing a whole booklet that they hand to people. Um, I work at Upstate Cerebral Palsy, so a lot of it came from that. Uh, Colorado Moms are a group of moms that just give information and help people in the Calvermans Center. So thank you 